Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Hi, guys. Let's uh, start with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for Philippians and its encouraging message and theme. Uh, Lord, may we behold you properly through your word. Um, may your spirit fill us, Lord, that the words of Christ may dwell in us richly. Um, may it impact our walk before you, Lord, and, and our fellowship with one another. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so we're going to be introducing the book of Philippians and looking at the first 11 verses. So let's go ahead and begin by reading uh, these first 11 verses. And I know it's probably kind of small on the overhead, um, but if you want to open your Bibles, Philippians 1, verses 1 through 11. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness how greatly I long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So <clears throat> today, um, to get an outline of what we're going to be doing, we'll, we'll introduce the book kind of briefly. Last week was going to be a whole sermon just devoted to an introduction to the book, but we ended up canceling because of the weather, and uh, we didn't want to jungle up the schedule too bad. So I'll do a brief introduction to the book. We'll look at the salutation, that is Paul's greeting, and then we'll, we'll get into the verses. But before uh, jumping into any book of the Bible, it's critical to answer some of those interrogative questions, these questions that journalists are always seeking to answer. Who, what, when, where, why? So who, who wrote the book? Who were the recipients? What was the historical occasion that prompted its writing? What's the literary genre? What was the date it, it was written? Where was it written? Um, all of these questions are, are really important. And so even for a personal Bible study, if you want to have a, a good idea of what passages are talking about, virtually every study Bible has a good um, introduction before the book. Um, or feel free to always approach a Brad or myself or any of us leaders here at the church, and we could offer some great resources. And for really deep questions, Ben is teaching New Testament surveys, so just ask Ben, and I'm sure he can answer those. Um, so, yeah. So let's, uh, let's go in and jump into that a bit. First of all, the authorship, as you saw in the very first verse, it's by the Apostle Paul, and uh, he mentions his companion Timothy. We're going to talk about Timothy in a moment. Um, the recipients are the believers in Philippi, along with their elders and deacons. The date of its composition is in the early 60s, not like contemporary with the Beatles 60s, but uh, first century 60s. So the church begins somewhere between AD 30 and AD 32, and within that decade probably, some of the first books of the New Testament are being penned by some of Jesus' followers, the last book being the book of Revelation, which was finished in around AD 95. And Paul's writing in between that. His earliest letters um, are in the early 50s, like Galatians and 1 Corinthians. And uh, he's finally um, persecuted or beheaded for his faith, the best we can tell historically, probably around 67 AD. And Philippians was written in the early 60s, sometimes between AD 60 and 62. It's one of the prison epistles. Perhaps we've all heard of that before. Um, he's in uh, house arrest in Rome, and he writes uh, this letter. Um, he also writes um, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. Uh, 
Um, he's released from house arrest, and, and he's out for a while, and then he gets arrested again at the very end of his life, in which he writes the pastoral epistles for 2 Timothy and Titus. Um, so it's interesting that um, the Apostle Paul is in prison when he writes this epistle about joy and encouragement in Christ. Um, in a lot of ways, the book of Philippians is like a thank you letter. Um, there's a man, Epaphroditus, we'll, we'll read about as we go through our study, who is possibly the pastor of the church in Philippi, and he brings a financial gift from the Philippian Christians to Paul while he's in jail to help him, uh, to help him along. And uh, while he's there, he gets violently ill. He almost dies, but the Lord spares him, and he's going to return home with this letter that the Apostle Paul writes. Um, uh, the, the church in Philippi was established uh, on Paul's second missionary journey. If you study through the book of Acts, you could see his different missionary journeys in the teens through 20s of, of the book of Acts. And uh, Acts 16 talks about um, his visit there and uh, how the church began uh, in Lydia's home, and, and it, it grows from there. Um, so Philippi was a province of Rome. Um, the significance of this is its citizens possessed something um, called Roman citizenship. They had many rights and privileges of being citizens of Rome. They didn't pay taxes, they had special protections, and they uh, took tremendous pride in their citizenship, which is why Paul has to remind them in the third chapter of Philippians that their citizenship is in heaven. Being born and raised in the United States, perhaps the most privileged country in the world, um, we could identify with them and uh, extremely applicable for us as well. As far as purposes of the book, uh, there's at least four. I think the fourth here will be the most significant that we'll talk about. First of all, it's to thank the Philippians for their financial support in Paul's ministry. This wasn't the first time that they had helped him. They'd helped him uh, probably two times before, and uh, we may talk about that when we get to the pertinent passages, but they were uh, very faithful believers to partner with Paul and to give sacrificially for the ministry. He writes to give a general warning against false teachers. This comes out in chapter 3 of Philippians. He writes to encourage the Philippians to stand firm uh, for the faith, to strive for the promotion of the gospel, and fourth, to encourage them to rejoice in the Lord regardless or despite their outward circumstances. Um, the word joy appears uh, at least a dozen times in Philippians, and it appears in every chapter, and it's kind of the, the theme that keeps being repeated and repeated. So let's quickly survey the um, frequency of joy coming up through this letter. In chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. A few verses later, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of the faith. We get to chapter 2. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. In verse 17 of chapter 2. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Uh, verse 18 of chapter 2, for the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. 228, therefore I send him the more eagerly that when you see him again you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. Verse 29 of chapter 2, receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem. Chapter 3, verse 1, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. 4-1, therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. 4-4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Verse 10 of chapter 4, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Are you guys tired of joy yet? Uh, this is a theme that's going to keep coming up in Philippians. <clears throat> and I, as I already mentioned, the interesting part is Paul's in prison, being persecuted for the faith, and yet he has this joy and writes to the Philippian Christians and to us 
to remind us to rejoice always in the Lord, that joy in the Christian life is based upon a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, not upon external circumstances. So what would be a good definition of joy? How should we define it? Should we just define it as happiness or gladness? Well, I, I like this definition that I got in Bible college when I took a class in, on Philippians. It's the abiding delight and contentment of the heart rooted in the person and work of Christ, grounded and steadfast regardless of the circumstances of life. So it is our occupation and relationship with the Lord Jesus that derives our joy as believers, not our circumstances. The book of Philippians is quite unique in many ways, um, especially amongst Paul's writings. For one, it's, there's not really any problem passages that scholars uh, constantly debate over and try to figure out. Uh, unlike the book of Hebrews that we were in last semester where there's all kinds of controversial passages, especially the warning passages and the like. Um, the most unique fact probably is that it doesn't contain a single Old Testament quotation. I think Philippians is probably the only New Testament book. Um, maybe Philemon doesn't. I'd have to look into that. But uh, it, this is a rare thing, and it indicates that uh, the population of the Philippian church was primarily Gentile believers. There wasn't a whole lot of Jews there. And in the city, as far as we know, there were no synagogues there. Uh, historically, there had to be 10 Jews to form a synagogue, if I'm not mistaken, and they didn't even have that. So hev heavily Gentile populated region, not a lot of allusions to the Old Testament scriptures. Um, again, Philippi was a Roman province, so the people there possessed Roman citizenship. Finally, Paul's occupation with Jesus Christ stands out significantly. There are 104 verses in Philippians, 51 verses make reference to the Lord Jesus by name. So we'll see um, the occupation with Jesus Christ being predominant throughout. Um, on that note, the Christ of Philippians, in um, chapter 1, uh, we see Paul talking about living as Christ. He says, for me to live is Christ. In chapter 2, he says Christ is the model for true humility. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Um, in chapter 3, he presents him as the one who will transform our lowly bodies, that it may be conformed to his glorious body. And in chapter 4, Paul says the source of his power is through Christ. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So it's no wonder that once we get into our verses and we get into Paul's prayer in the first 11 verses, that we see him reflecting the heart of God. In fact, I've entitled verses 1 through 11, Praying with the Heart of God, because all of his motivation, all of his passion, all of his priority um, reflects that of the Lord. And no wonder with how occupied Paul was with the Lord Jesus Christ that we see so powerfully throughout this letter. So enough of an introduction. Let's get into the salutation, the first two verses. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Interesting here, Paul doesn't refer to himself as the Apostle Paul. He just refers to himself as Paul. And unlike Corinthians or Galatians, he doesn't have to write to defend his apostolic ministry or authority in this letter. Um, he's, he's writing more heartfelt to his fellow believers there. Also, Paul is his Gentile name. Maybe he was identifying with his Gentile audience in Philippi. Um, he writes with his um, companion, Timothy. Um, Timothy is a prominent figure in the New Testament in the book of Acts as well as in the epistles, mentions often made to him just kind of off-the-cuff statements. And then, of course, First and Second Timothy are addressed personally to Timothy from Paul. Uh, Timothy was a, a younger pastor who was a disciple of Paul. He becomes an emissary and representative of Paul and the apostles. He's associated with Paul in, in apparently some unique way with Paul's imprisonment. However, he's not personally present with Paul because Paul refers to him later in the third person. 
So he doesn't help Paul write this letter, but uh, again, he's intimately associated with him in his circumstance. We'll read uh, in chapter two that Paul intends to send Timothy to them with a note of encouragement and uh, update on Paul's situation. So um, Paul and Timothy are in the salutation and then he gives them his usual grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. It says in Romans 5 that having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And the next verse it says we, we stand in this sphere of grace as a result of that. And of course, as a consequence of being in the grace of God, being properly related to him, we have peace with God, both in a salvation sense as well as in a practical sense daily, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we get into Paul's prayer for the Philippian saints, again praying with the heart of God. His prayer is really divided uh, into two points. He gives a praise of gratitude for the Philippian saints, for their love for the Lord, their partnership in the gospel. And then he gives a petition for their growth. Again, this is a spirit-filled prayer uh, full of love and affection. Let's look at the first point, the praise of gratitude in verses 3 through 8. And the aspects I want to look at as we evaluate these verses is Paul's attitude in this prayer, Paul's anticipation, and then Paul's affection. First of all, the attitude, it's an attitude of gratitude and gladness. In verse 3, it says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Right off the bat, he gives a prayer of gratitude, of thanksgiving for these saints. Now, it's interesting. I imagine if I were in prison and I were writing a letter to FCBC, I would probably be saying, uh, please pray that God gets me out of here as soon as possible. Please pray that God protects me. Please pray that God meets my needs, keeps me encouraged, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But right away, Paul's focused not on himself, but on others. And he gives a prayer of thanksgiving for them. How often in your prayer life is it just set apart to thanking God, not just for the blessings in your own life, but for the service that other Christians in ministry are, are given? Maybe it's a thanksgiving for, for pastors or thanksgiving just for friends or people who are serving in the church or in the ministry of any kind. The Bible tells us in all circumstances give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. A Christ-centered life always puts others first, and it will be no different in our prayer life. So he gives thanksgiving for them. He remembers them. They are in Paul's mind. We'll read in a few verses that they're in his heart. He gives a supplication for them. It talks. He says here in every request he makes for them in, in verse 4, this request is a, a seeking or asking and entreating to God on their behalf. And he thanks God particularly for their fellowship with him in the gospel. Now, this word fellowship is a very important word, I think. It's koinonia in the Greek. It means joint participation, a closeness of intimacy, a harmonious rapport of, of two parties. In the most simple, straightforward sense, it's two parties sharing a singular interest or goal. And <clears throat> the, the most pure form of Christian fellowship is this. If you have one believer who's in fellowship with God, that is, he's occupied with the Lord Jesus Christ, he's confessed his known sin, and he's walking in the Spirit, he's in fellowship with God. And you have another Christian who's in fellowship with God, naturally their fellowship is with one another and with the Lord. Now, of course, the, the word fellowship could be used in an extra biblical sense or a non-spiritual sense, but that true spiritual fellowship should be first with the Lord and then with one another, and he is our common interest or principle. 
and his mission is the glue that, that holds us together. So often, I think ministry is wrongly thought about like an airplane, where you have pilots who fly the plane, that's those in full-time ministry, and then everyone else sits back in their seats and enjoys the ride, relies on the service of the stewards and others until they get to the destination. But actually, ministry is more like a, a giant a rowboat with many oars, where everyone has their own paddle and everybody is driving the ship together. That is God's intended purpose uh, in ministry and in fellowship. And so Paul thanks the Lord for their fellowship in the gospel. So I already mentioned that a Christ-centered life always puts others first. A Christ-centered life also makes the gospel preeminent. It shares the heart of God in desiring all people being saved and coming to a knowledge of the truth. In verse 5, Paul talks about the fellowship of the gospel. In verse 7, he talks about the confirmation of the gospel. In verse 12, he talks about the progress of the gospel. In verse 16, he talks about the defense of the gospel. In verse 27, he talks about living worthy of the gospel. In verse 27, again, he talks about striving for the faith of the gospel. In 2.22, he talks about the service in the gospel. In 4.3, he talks about labor in the gospel. And in 4.15, he talks about the beginning of the gospel. But the gospel keeps coming up. It keeps coming up. Paul was certainly gospel-driven. The gospel was of preeminent importance in the mind of the Apostle Paul and of every Christian who lives a Christ-centered life. What is the gospel? Again, gospel means good news, the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul couldn't make this any simpler. He says, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand but which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Never forget the simplicity of the gospel. We are sinners, we've fallen short of the glory of God, but the good news is the Lord Jesus Christ died as a substitute for us, he bore our sin the, on the cross. He was buried. God has raised him from the dead the third day. Anyone who believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy has he saved us. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. This is Christ's mission and commission that he gives to us to seek and to save the lost and a Christ-centered life will be a gospel-driven life. So we looked at the attitude of, of Paul's praise here. It's an attitude of gratitude and gladness. Now let's look at the anticipation in his prayer. He anticipates the promises of God. Verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know, thinking all the way back to uh, Christ's model prayer for the disciples, when they say, Lord, how should we pray? And he gives the model prayer that's often called the Lord's Prayer. He says, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As we've seen in the Matthew series, in that particular context and time, the, the kingdom was being offered through Jesus Christ. But what he does in that model prayer is he teaches them to pray for what is imminent, that which God has promised. So Paul does the exact thing here. He's confident in his prayer of this very thing, that God is going to bring the works that he started in them to perfect completion at the day of Jesus Christ, which is the rapture, our blessed hope. That is what we are looking forward to as believers. That is what we should be anticipating most. That's what Paul anticipates in his prayers. He anticipates the promises of God being fulfilled. This word confident, it means thoroughly convinced or persuaded. Paul is thoroughly persuaded that what God has promised he's going to do, he will indeed do. Now, what is this good work which God has begun in them? Uh, many commentators uh, say that it's the work of salvation, which is uh, theologically true that God, of course, is going to bring our salvation to perfect completion. Um, but I think in context um, here, 
uh, it's talking about the gift that they've given Paul, their partnership in the, in the gospel ministry and the financial gift that they've given towards it. God's going to use that good work and bring it to an absolute fruition in the body of Christ in the future when he returns, when he gives rewards. You see, every act of service we do when we're filled with the Spirit of God um, has repercussions to it that expand and that expand and that expand that we can't see. Uh, I think back to um, people that were instrumental in me coming to Christ and who was instrumental in them coming to Christ and back and back and back so, so far to the first century to Jesus himself. But when you think about it, why doesn't God just judge believers the moment they die? Why doesn't he give them their rewards then and it, it, why isn't it settled? Well, perhaps it's in a future date because the work that you're doing for Christ now will continue to have ongoing effects even after you die. And God's going to take all of that into account when you get rewarded on the day of Christ. But notice it's a work that God has begun in them and that God will bring to completion. Uh, this is the, the message of the Christian life. It is God who works in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. From start to finish, it's all about who and what God is and what he's doing in us, whether that's when he saved us or as he is sanctifying us or he will glorify us. It goes back to God and the grace of God. This phrase, uh, the, the day of Christ, uh, it's mentioned here in verse 6. It's mentioned again in verse 10. It's mentioned in chapter 2, and it's a reference to the rapture of the church, Christ coming for his saints in the air. When we are transformed, when we get a, our resurrection bodies, for those of us that are alive, we'll be translated um, perfectly and we'll be as Christ is. There will be the judgment seat of Christ where rewards will be given. And uh, if you understand um, the 24 elders in the book of Revelation to be a reference to the resurrected church, we will take all of our rewards and cast them at Christ's feet on that day because he was the one working through us to begin with. Uh, C.I. Schofield, uh, how does that phrase go? Our hope is built on nothing less than Schofield's notes in Moody Press. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, uh, but Schofield usually has some great, great notes. He says this, um, the day of Christ points to the day when Christ will return for his own in the rapture. There are at least 18 references to this day in the New Testament. The expression is similar to the day of the Lord, and the Old Testament day of Jehovah. However, in contrast to the Old, Old Testament emphasis on judgment, the day of Christ Jesus is mentioned in all cases with reference to the New Testament church. It will be the time when Christ returns for his church, salvation is finally completed, and believers' works are examined, and the believer rewarded. So Paul's thoroughly persuaded, thoroughly convinced that the work that God started in them through a simple act of their financial giving, God is going to bring to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. And that is true for every work you do when you're filled with the Spirit that you do in the motivation to glorify Christ. He will bring it to completion. So we've seen Paul's attitude in his praise and what that looks like to have a Christ-centered attitude in prayer. We've seen that he anticipates the promises of God. Let's now look at the affection, the love, that is in his prayer. In verse 7, it says, Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and the defense and confirmation of the gospels, you are all partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. He says, I have you in my heart. You notice earlier when he said in every remembrance of you, he had these saints in his mind, he had them in his heart, and of course he has them in his prayers. The term heart in, in the Bible, in the New Testament, um, refers to our entire person, our entire being, our intellect, our emotions, our will. It's not just sentiment, it's the entire person. And Paul says, I have you in me, in my entire being as I'm occupied with Christ, again, his prayer reflects the heart of God. Um, our standing is in Christ, and our joint commission to share his gospel are the glue that bind us all together in the body of Christ. And, and Paul says, as I pray for you, I have you in me with the affection of Christ. 
literally with, it, with the bowels of Christ, and this is used figuratively to, to uh, convey the deepest of passion and love. When you pray for other Christians or other people in general, do you pray with the heart of Christ in that manner? Do you pray with that kind of passion and that kind of love? Maybe you're praying for other saints uh, in gratitude like Paul is. Maybe you're praying that God would answer some petition, would meet someone's need. Maybe you're praying for the salvation of a, of a loved one or a friend. Do you have the heart of God like this when you pray? And maybe you say, I don't think so. Well, as we grow in Christ, the more we grow in Christ, the more we live a spirit-led life, the more our prayers start looking this way. I'm not saying to become frantic because your prayer life isn't perfect. I'm probably the only one in this room whose prayer life is absolutely perfect. I'm kidding. But um, it's a growing process. It's a growing process. But Paul exemplifies what it looks like to pray with the heart of Christ. So we looked at the praise. Let's look at the petition for growth. Verses 9 through 11. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. First of all, he prays that they continue to grow in their love for one another. But notice the love isn't just love, this deep affection that seeks the highest and best for its object, regardless of personal cost, but it's a love in knowledge and in discernment. Blind love is a very dangerous thing. People throw away their entire lives over blind love. And God in the Christian life doesn't call us to have a blind love, an uninformed love, a purely subjective love, but God wants our love to be objective which is informed by the truth of his word that emulates his son, that is empowered by his spirit. The Bible says the love of God is uh, shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Similarly, Galatians 5 says the fruit of the spirit is love. The Bible says God is love, and of course the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrates or exemplifies divine love more than anything else. And he gives us that pattern to follow. He says, love one another just as I have loved you. What kind of love did Christ have? He had a love that was willing to give his life for others. The only way we could have this love is through God's spirit, being informed by God's truth, built upon the example of Jesus Christ. It is sincere. It is sacrificial. It is selfless. And it's in knowledge and discernment. One commentator says, we grow in proportion as we know. To grow as a Christian is to grow in one's grasp of the truth in breadth and in depth. Ignorance is a, is a root cause of stunted growth. God doesn't just call us to grow in love, but in a love that is discerning and knowledgeable. He also wants them to be able to approve of the right things. He prays for their discernment. Um, again, in verse 10, it says that you may approve the things that are excellent. You may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So this idea of discerning or approving of the right things, what is the significance of this? Well, it's being able to approve of the things that God approves of, to be able to have the values that the Lord has. Instead of just using our own values, we adopt the values of the Lord Jesus. Thomas Constable says, possessing this kind of abounding love would enable the Philippians to give approval to the things of the greatest value and importance. Conversely, they would disapprove of things of lesser significance. Most of the choices that a spiritual believer faces are not between morally good and morally evil things, but between things of lesser and greater value. The things that we choose because we love them reflect how we discerning, how we discerning, how we, excuse me, how we discern our love. So um, being able to approve of the things that God approves of is central to growth in the Christian life. You know, my value structure has completely changed since I was five years old. 
and it probably has for all of you too, the things that I valued most, maybe my toys or my bike, myself, the things that I approved of. I used to approve of eating Doritos for breakfast, not so much anymore, but it's no different in the Christian life. We go from having values built upon selfish motivations or worldly motivations, carnal motivations, but as we grow in Christ, we value the things that the Lord Jesus values. Uh, we adopt his point of view. So he wants them to grow in love, in discernment, in purity. In verse 11, he says, or rather, um, the second half of verse 10, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. This word uh, sincere has to do with uh, purity that is tested and that is without flaw. And the blamelessness here has to do with, um, with something that doesn't cause stumbling. It's, it's used over in 1 Corinthians 10.32 when it talks about not doing anything that would cause a fellow believer to stumble. So this purity here, this sincerity that the Apostle Paul is praying for them is one that is tested without flaw and that doesn't cause stumbling. And that goes a little deeper in love than just what we usually think about in terms of purity. Finally, he prays for their productivity, fruits of righteousness. He says in verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. In the Christian life, all of us possess the righteousness of God through what's called imputation. The moment we believe in Jesus Christ, God imputes or credits to us the perfect righteousness of Christ. And he declares us righteous, and that's what enables us to live forever with God. God is morally perfect. God is perfectly righteous. We could never live eternally with God without that. So he credits that to the believer the moment they accept Christ. Romans 4 talks about this. And so we possess the perfect righteousness of God through faith. But Paul here talks about fruits of righteousness. And I think very possibly here as we live our Christian life based upon the fact that we have the perfect righteousness of Christ, that we are complete in Christ, lacking nothing, that is the horse that pulls the cart, so to speak. When Christians try to say that we need to have our, attain our own righteousness in order to be approved by God, they're getting the cart before the horse, really. It's because we're perfect in Christ, because we possess his perfect righteousness and are declared just before God, that we have the ability to live a righteous life before him through the Holy Spirit that indwells us. But this fruit of righteousness, these fruits in the Christian life, this productivity, like we talked about earlier, has to come from the Lord. Turn with me to John 15 if you have your Bibles open. Jesus uses this analogy or allegory of, of vine and branches to illustrate this exact point. He talks about early on that he is the vine and we are the branches. In verse 4, he says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. So if you take a branch and you cut it off of a vine or a tree, can it produce fruit? No, the fruit comes from the trunk or the vine. And the branch is the mere conduit, if you will, that the fruit is grown through. So it is in the Christian life. If we want to have fruits of righteousness, how does that happen? Well, we're properly related to the Lord Jesus. We're occupied with him. We abide or continue in him, he says. And he produces the fruit through us. That is the fruit that yields rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, those rewards that we cast at his feet to honor and glorify him. 
You see how the motivation in the Christian life as it's set forth in the New Testament is a motivation of love and of gratitude for what God has done for us, and therefore we want to serve him. It's not a motivation of fear to gain God's approval or to earn salvation, but it's a motivation of love and of gratitude. So Paul prays for their fruit, their productivity in the Christian life, which results in the glory and praise of God. Again, Paul prays with the heart of God. We see that the priority of Paul's prayer was centered on the gospel and the mission of God to save the lost. The passion of his prayer reflected the heart of God and affection for the saints. And the petition in his prayer centered on the will of God for the growth of God's people. If you want to know if your life is filled with the Spirit and you are growing in Christ, evaluate the content and quality of your prayers. Paul's prayer contains all these characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit or of a Spirit-filled life. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, uh, etc., etc., thankfulness. We see a bunch of these elements in Paul's prayer. And perhaps all of them, not explicitly, but implicitly. So when you pray, pray with the heart of God, and this is what your prayers will begin to look like. We'll close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word, which lives and abides forever. Thank you, Lord, that it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness, that we may be mature, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Uh, thank you, Lord, for how powerful it is. As we're uh, going through Philippians, Lord, help us to have your joy Help us to have a Christ-centered life, that we may pray with the heart of God, that we may serve you in the power of your spirit. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.